Bibles and turn to Daniel chapter number 6. Daniel chapter number 6. <clears throat> you won't believe what the title of my sermon is. Worshiping with the windows open. And I did not plan it that way, but we are worshiping tonight with the windows open. And, uh, of course, going to Daniel chapter number 6, I trust that many of you tonight who have studied the Bible and read the Bible for a long time will recognize where we're heading is uh, the account of Daniel in the lion's den and his prayer and his worship with the windows open. It's a classic story, isn't it? Daniel in the lion's den, it's a classic story. But as I read it several times in preparation for this message, I was reminded it's still, even though it's a classic, it's so timely, even still. Because we are continually challenged in our life on this subject. Are we going to worship with the windows open? I mean, metaphorically, in our own life, will we worship public? Will we let our worship of God be known in the public forum? Will we let other people hear us pray, see us read, see us carry a Bible, uh, to hear us talk about Jesus? Will, will we in our life let our windows be open in our worship? And I, I don't think I'm the only one who can understand Daniel's um, uh, predicament, or not a predicament, maybe that's the in, incorrect word, but the the uh, carefulness that he must have um, known that he it was in a different place where opening the windows to pray was a dangerous thing. Uh, I feel that at times in this world, don't you? Um, uh, there was a deliberate premeditated attack on Daniel's worship life. That's what Daniel in the lion's den is. That's what the story is. A deliberate premeditated attack on Daniel's worship. And culturally, we are experiencing some attacks on our worship, on how much we could say in public, how much we're able to do in public, how vocal we can be about our faith in Christ in the public forum. It's one thing to worship. It's another thing to do it publicly. And I wanted to challenge us on this thought, not whether or not we will worship but whether or not we will leave the windows open when we do, and, and here's another little, little twist that, that got my, my, my brain sort of, uh, uh, I, I just couldn't really rationalize it out, but let me just wrote what I, tell you what I wrote. If you do, quote, unquote, close the windows when you worship God, is it really worship anyways? Now think about that. Well, let's say, for instance, Someone says, well, I really love my husband, but I don't want anybody to know. Well, then do you really love him anyways? I mean, you see where I'm going with that? If, if we are afraid for someone else to see it, then is it really worship anyways? So some would argue and say, well, Daniel could have just, you know, he didn't have to be so public about the thing. Maybe the fact that he had to be public about his worship and his prayer was what made his prayer real. It's what made it genuine. Uh, I was doing some study, and uh, it's amazing how, how crazy things you can find when you're studying. There, there are some, some books and some, some um, uh, online articles that will boast themselves to be uh, spiritually ground, grounded pieces of literature, and they are the furthest from it. This one wanted to expose the Bible contradiction. Now get this. They said there's contradictions in the Bible. I thought, where are the contradictions in the Bible? They said it's contradictions everywhere, and this is one of the biggest ones, because Jesus said when you pray, you go in your closet and you close the door, and Daniel, when he prayed, went into his place and opened the windows. So look at the Bible contradiction. I thought, how, how, how many straws are they grabbing at to find Bible contradictions? It's not a contradiction at all. I trust that we're mature enough tonight to see that. It's not a contradiction. When Jesus said, when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Anybody here uh, 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 agree with me on this? Daniel was not a hypocrite. See somebody say amen there. He was not a hypocrite. 
this man's life was thoroughly spiritual. He was completely in love with his God. And his prayer was in no way hypocritical. But Jesus said, when thou prayest, be not as the hypocrites, because they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corner of the streets that they may be seen of men. And right away, this particular thing I read said, see the contradiction? Daniel prayed so he could be seen by people. And Jesus said, you shouldn't pray so that you could be seen by people. So as a contradiction. And here's the next words in that Matthew passage that I just read. That they may be seen of men. Jesus said, verily I say unto you, they have their reward. You know why the hypocrite prays? For personal gain. You know why the hypocrite prayed in the, in the synagogue, the corner of the streets? So he could find praise. So he could be lifted up. And, and in no way, shape, or form can you apply that to Daniel. When Daniel prayed in his home with his windows being open. He was praying so that others may see, but they may see for a different reason. There's nothing wrong with somebody seeing us pray. There's nothing wrong with someone hearing us pray. There's nothing wrong with us doing good things for the Lord and other people seeing that. And here's why. Jesus said, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And glorify who? Glorify your Father, which is in heaven. Those, those selfish Pharisees and, and chief priests and scribes who prayed in public were in no way concerned about God's glory. They were only concerned about their glory. And Jesus told his disciples, cautioned them. In, in essence to say, look, if, if, if glory is a problem, you pray in the closet because you don't need no glory. That's where you pray. And Daniel wasn't seeking his own glory. He was seeking the glory of God. And he was being a faithful man. I'll ask this question before we read in chapter number 6. Uh, what would make the difference whether Daniel had his windows open or Daniel prayed with his windows closed? The obvious answer is, well, it's easy to have your windows open if there's no den of lions waiting around the bend. But I think it's a little bit deeper than that. I think there's more at play in this passage on really what made it possible for Daniel to have such courage to pray with windows open. And I, I'm taking some of these things tonight, uh, and I pray that you'll be able to uh, apply them in your own life, because I want these things to push me onward in my faith to be able to worship with my windows open, to worship in my public environment, to pray in my public place, to carry my Bible in a public place, to be willing to open up my Bible when I'm at the McDonald's restaurant. I want to have my worship be public too. Um, let's read our text in Daniel chapter number 6. We'll sort of be at several places, but just to start off, we'll be at verse number 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day, and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. So how could Daniel do it? How could Daniel do it? How could he be so, so um, uh, uh, powerfully motivated by faith to pray with his windows open, with that oppression. Well, the first thing I want you to see, and I really only have two points tonight, so we should not be long. I, I uh, trust we will not. But number one, there was a testimony that he had already established. You know why it was easier for him to pray with the windows open? Because he had already established a testimony of doing so in his life. Um, verse number one of chapter number six gives us a new name that we had not seen yet, at least in our, in our study of, the, of these. Uh, last week was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and tonight with this uh, chapter 6, we see a verse number 1 that pleased Darius. Who's Darius? 
Darius is the new king of the Medes and the Persians, which used to be the Babylonians. Uh, here's what's interesting. Daniel had lived through three kings already. Anybody know the names of the other two kings? Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is in verse number or chapter number 5, and Nebuchadnezzar is in chapters, I believe, 1 through 4. And so then we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar, then Belshazzar in number 5, and now we have Darius in, in uh, chapter number 6. So the Babylonian Empire, or the Babylonian leadership, had gone through changes. These were drastic changes in leadership. And they were different styles of leadership in the country. And Nebuchadnezzar was sort of a proud man and a, and a, and a, a man who sought worship for himself. And it seems like uh, Darius is more of a, of a law kind of guy, just wants the law to be there. And, and uh, that there's rules. We've got to operate this thing by rules. And, and uh, so all of these men have different traits. But here's what's so wonderful. Daniel survived three different kings in Babylon. And Daniel's life was consistent through three kings in Babylon and the Medes and the Persians. One of the reasons why he could pray with his windows open is because he had been faithful. He had been faithful. His testimony had been clearly established. He was young when he came into Babylon, and at times he enjoyed respect for his faith. There were times when they were courteous toward Daniel for his faith. There were other times that there was great tolerance for his faith, but this isn't one of them. So in the, in the, in the uh, Babylonian Empire, there were times of tolerance and then intolerance. There was times of kindness and then unkindness. There was times of respect for Daniel and then no respect for Daniel. But through all of the changes, through all of the kings, it's like Daniel is just faithful in his walk with God all the way through. All the way through. That's why it wasn't so hard to leave the windows open. It wasn't so hard. He had a, a spiritual legacy that he had developed in this place. And as Daniel, I was trying to envision what Daniel would be like walking around Babylon. Uh, he had a position of, of, uh, of power. In verse number 2, in chapter number 6, the Bible says, And over these three presidents, of whom uh, Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have uh, no damage. So part of the law structure or, 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 or organizational structure that Darius had set up was 120 princes, and on top of the 120 princes were three presidents, and these three uh, presidents in verse number 2 were, had oversight of the 120. And of the three presidents, there was one of those presidents that had chief among the three, who was just under Darius, Daniel. How do, you think, how do you think they viewed Daniel as being this Jewish outsider, being the king president under Darius? You know that rubbed them the wrong way. This had to rub them the wrong way. And then to make matters worse, these presidents and princes watched Daniel walk right past every temple. Because Daniel had already made established, I'm not worshiping like that. I don't worship these gods. I worship my God, Jehovah God. And when they saw Daniel walk past their temple, and when they saw Daniel walk past a group of people who were all doing maybe their genuflex or whatever they did in their, in their false worship, and Daniel just stood there, it had to irritate them to no end. To never participate in their feasts, to be untouched by the rituals of false, uh, of false worship and false idols, Daniel had, had exhibited clearly through three reigns of three kings a consistent, spiritual, godly testimony. And when you do that, it's easy to pray with the windows open. Maybe I should say it this way. Until you develop that pattern of worshiping God faithfully, it's hard to do it in boldness when there's oppression. We all like to think that we will, when the time comes, we will stand firm in the face of a challenge. But if we're not standing firm when it's easy, when we should just be faithful, it isn't going to happen when the challenge comes. Daniel had established a good testimony. 
And worship, our worship, goes beyond church. I wrote in my notes, this is how I wrote it, it's from my heart. My worship didn't start when I came into church tonight, and it won't end after we say the last amen. Worship isn't relegated to just an hour and 15 minutes at a, at a, at a, at a, in, in this building. Daniel worshiped God in his whole life. His whole life was a life of worship. And he was faithful. And Daniel's worship didn't start in Babylon. It's not like, oh man, I've just been captive. I've just been taken captive. And, and I know there's going to be some hard challenges ahead. So I am going to start on with the Lord and start my worship. I believe Daniel was praying hard and walking with God before Nebuchadnezzar ever took him out of Judah. Amen. Just faithful. Just faithful. Well, do we love God on Sunday? Yeah. I hope we do. Let's love God on Monday. Do we pray on Sunday? I hope we do. Then let's pray on Tuesday. You, you uh, worship God in the church house, then worship God in the schoolhouse. Right? You, you walk with the Lord uh, on, on Sunday, then do it with your family. I believe that's the kind of life Daniel had. This wasn't some momentary competition between he and some co-workers. This is a testimony he had long established in his life. And here's one more thing that I uh, sort of goes along that same point. Look at verse number four uh, of, uh, actually verse number three of chapter six. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes because an excellent spirit was in him and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And then the presidents and princes sought to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Now let's stop right there. What kind of accusation are they trying to find? According to that, find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Some way in which he's dishonest, maybe. And we got something else. What are they trying to find here? Something about the kingdom. We're trying to find occasion against Daniel concerning the kingdom. Anybody else? Some thoughts on this? Who said that? Something against the king? Brother Ernie, Ern that's what you're going to say? Uh, how about a way in maybe he was uh, thievery? A way in which he was maybe lazy? They're trying to find him being lazy? Uh, dishonest? Not paying his taxes? <laughs> uh, forging a signature? You know, and we can think of a lot of things. Here are these guys saying, we got to find something. we got to find something against Daniel that will be just social in its, in its application. Something, something every day. So the, what I'm trying to say, it wasn't about his prayer. It wasn't about his Bible reading. It, was, it wasn't about his walk with the Lord, per se. They're just trying to find something against him as a president, as a citizen. Collusion. Yeah, <laughs> and it says collusion. So how could Daniel, just, just follow my thoughts here, and I pray it makes sense. How could Daniel pray with the windows open? And it's not only because he had a consistent walk with God through those three kings and through all the time as a Babylon, but it also means that he was a man of integrity. There's a certain amount of life courage that comes by being a person who lives right. Does that make sense? A little bit of life's courage comes by living right, by being right. By doing right. Put, put aside the spiritual, and I know you can't really put aside spiritual things from this, but I'm saying put aside the prayer and, and the word of God and maybe your walk with the Lord, and let's just analyze this on being honest and being right and being a hard worker and being on time and, and being diligent and, and following orders and, and just put down that list that we would just say works in the workplace. And they couldn't find anything on that list to accuse Daniel about. And I believe that contributed to make it a little bit easier for Daniel to pray with some windows open. Pray with some windows open. He had established a life of integrity and a spiritual life. There's another thing in verse number 10 that I believe helped him keep the windows open. 
In verse number 10, the Bible says, When he knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, his windows being opened in his chamber. And the Bible says they were opened which direction, according to verse number 10? It was toward Jerusalem. Toward Jerusalem. You know that Jerusalem was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. Judah was taken by Nebuchadnezzar. The temple was destroyed by these kings. And um, I don't want to over-spiritualize it, but do you sense that Daniel, when he was praying, as he did often, and I believe even looking toward Jerusalem when he prayed is the way he prayed often, does anybody else see it this way, that Daniel's prayer was sort of an indication and looking toward Jerusalem was an indication of the longing of his heart? Home. Home. Praying for Jerusalem. Praying for Judah. Praying for home. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. And that's a song we sing. But I believe one of the reasons why it's hard for us to quote unquote worship with our windows open is because we love this world too much. Because when we're in love with this world, we sort of don't want to face a challenge, right? We sort of don't want to face a hardship. We, we don't want to fight these battles. If Daniel had loved his job and his new position in Babylon more than he had love and care and a longing for home, then maybe he wouldn't have prayed with his windows open. A love for the world, and we all should be on guard against this, that our heart would not be in love with this world. But if our heart becomes in love with the world, can I tell you what happens? Worship always becomes mechanical and empty. Let me say that again. When we fall in love with this world, our worship will always be mechanical and empty. Oh, you'll still be able to pray, but you won't be able to pray with a longing heart for heaven and for God because your heart sort of longs for this world and the things here. Oh, you'll still be able to sing a little bit, but you won't be able to sing with a heart that longs for God and for home and for heaven because your heart's sort of here. I believe Daniel's heart was aching. You say, well, why would his heart ache? He's got a good job. He's probably making really good money. He is second under Darius. He probably has servants here, servants there, things being done for him, people at his beck and call. Why in the world would Daniel have a heavy heart? Because he is in a place where he don't belong. And I'm just reminding us tonight, it's our Sunday night crowd. We are in a place we don't belong here. This ain't our home. This ain't our home. Worship is amped up a few levels as our love for God increases and our love for this world decreases. Uh, if any man love the world, the Bible says, the love of the Father is where? It's not him. Because our love for God can't coexist with the love for the world in the heart. The heart can't have two masters, and the heart can't have two longings. So when Daniel got on his knees with those windows being open, and he prayed there, part of the reason why the windows could be open is because his heart was so passionate in that prayer. It was a place he longed for. He was praying like a person being in a place that did not belong. He prayed like a foreigner. That's the way I put it. He prayed like a foreigner. How would our worship be changed if we worshiped like foreigners? Like we don't belong here, we shouldn't be here, we're waiting for Jesus, can't wait till he comes back. I believe that changes worship. Changes worship. It's a place that he longed for. And I like this about this particular story. Who doesn't, who doesn't enjoy a, um, a good ending, right? Look, if you would, at our text again in verse number 11, where the Bible says, These men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? 
The king answered and said, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altereth not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. And then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself. I think that's telling right there. What's so telling about Darius being displeased was he knew who Daniel was. A man of faith, integrity, honesty, goodness, work ethic. And it hurt his heart that Daniel was being dece uh, uh, trapped by these evil men. So the king set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. And look, you say, well, oh man, isn't it sad that Darius couldn't deliver Daniel? Not at all, because Daniel still gets delivered, amen? We don't have to have people bail us out all the time. We don't have to have people set the record straight. We don't have to have somebody intervene on our behalf all the time. Many times it's good to just step back and let God intervene if nobody else will. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and the Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed. And then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spake and said unto Daniel, I like this, Thy God whom thou servest continually he will deliver thee. Does that sound weird to anybody else? Let me phrase it this way. The faith of Daniel was so strong that an unbeliever believed that Daniel's God would deliver him. That is amazing to me. And so it would be impossible for anybody here to convince me that Daniel didn't believe that he would be delivered when Darius believed that Daniel would be delivered. So this brings me to my last point. How could Daniel pray with his windows being open? Is because he knew that God would deliver. You say, oh, that, uh, who, who knows? How did Daniel know? Well, here, here's one little side note that you should remember. Daniel knew a lot of things before they happened. Amen. I mean, Daniel was a, he was a prophecy machine. Uh, the book of Daniel is a, prophecy, is a thick prophecy book. But even beyond all of that, Daniel was such a man of faith that he opened up those windows knowing, lion's den, what? You say, that sounds just sort of crass and arrogant. I don't think so. I think his faith was so powerful that Daniel wasn't stirred by no den of lions. The triumph that Daniel enjoyed, the triumph that he believed that he would enjoy. L let me put it this way in, in our practical application before I close. I believe we would pray a little bit more fervently in public if we believed that God would use those public prayers. But we don't always believe that God's going to do something great with the public prayer. We believe that the public prayer is going to cause us some kind of ridicule, some kind of demotion, some kind of dismissal, some kind of schism. And so we believe that, that the prayer that we may pray publicly will actually harm instead of being tri being, bringing triumph. And what I'm saying tonight is Daniel knew that I'm going to pray and something great's going to come out of this. He had such faith to believe that there would be triumph. And he believed it firmly in his heart. And his faith was powerfully evident even in the unbelieving pagans around him. So there he was, put in the den of lions. And a stone, verse 17, a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. And then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him. And his sleep went from him. Just sort of on, on off script a little bit. I wonder if Daniel slept like a baby down in that den. Maybe so. While well, the king can't. 
And then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. Verse 20, And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spake and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God whom thou servest continually, and there's his faithfulness again, his faithfulness was so evident, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angel. Oh, I, I hope someday in heaven God gives us a little DVD screen we could see some of this. Something. Some kind of newsreel. Some, some kind of video in the sky where we can witness what it looks like for an angel to stand in a den of lions. Maybe you feel differently. I believe Daniel saw the angel. It could very well be that Daniel spent some of the night talking to the angel. What's going on up there in heaven? He communed with that angel. And then the Bible says the angels shut the mouths of the lions. I'd like to know what that looks like. Did he use hands? Did he just put his hand out and they all couldn't open their mouths? Lockjaw? All that they had lockjaw? Who knows? Don't know what, what it looked like. But when that angel came in that den of lions, the mouths were shut. And Daniel said, and they have not hurt me for as much as before him. Innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Let's take a reality check here because I, I think sometimes we use phrases that don't apply to us. We'll say, well, preacher, you don't understand. I'm just in a den of lions right now. It's rough. I mean, work is breathing down my neck. Uh, I got trouble in, you know, trouble at, uh, uh, in other places, and, and I got bills that are due, and it just seems like I'm in the den of lions. Here's the hard fact, uh, the, the hard reality of it. Daniel was suffering for righteousness' sake. He said, look, God knew that I was in here of no fault of my own. And let's be honest with ourselves. Sometimes the fact that we can't pay a bill is our fault. Sometimes the health problems we may have, it may be our fault. Sometimes the, diff the argument we have when so-and-so may be our fault. But I was reminded of this scripture. Jesus said, Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and shall persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, Jesus said. This is all Matthew 5. For great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I don't want to sound insane, but maybe this sounds insane to you. I think Daniel enjoyed this whole experience. Why wouldn't he? What's not to enjoy? Could you find anything in this text that's not to enjoy? I can't find anything in this story that I would say, man, that's a bummer. That's just terrible. You say, but his co-workers were plotting against him. It turned out okay. Yeah, but the, the king couldn't change the law. That turned out okay. Yeah, but you don't understand. There were hungry lions in the den. Yeah, that turned out okay. But you don't understand, they sealed it up with a, with, a, with a stone and covered it up so nobody could get in. That's okay, an angel got in there. I don't see any downside to this. But yet Daniel's being persecuted. Here's the last truth and we'll close. I think it was easy for him to leave the, door, the windows open because there's something about when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake that is a little bit joyful. Or maybe that sounds weird. Some of you are going to say, admit pastor in this asylum because he's talking about how persecution is joyful. Jesus said, rejoice and be exceeding glad. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. Here's how I'll close. If we've never worshipped with the windows open, 
if we've never allowed people at work to see our worship of God, if we've never allowed our family to realize that we worship the true and living God, if we've never evidenced our love for God publicly, we you say, well, I've missed out on some persecution because I know if I say something at work, I might get canned. But you know what else you missed out on? You missed out on the joy of being persecuted for righteousness's sake. I don't, know explain, I, I don't know how to explain how that happens. But I promise you this, we get to heaven someday and ask Daniel, say, how was that day when you got cast into the lion's den? Here's how he's, I, I believe here's how he'll respond. Oh, that was an awesome day. That was just so cool that day. And we don't experience that because before we pray, we close windows. Before we open a Bible, we make sure no one's looking. Before we say a word about Christ, we make sure that it's sort of in a place where it's sort of secret. I, I, I say tonight, let's open the windows. Let's not be ashamed that we worship God Almighty and our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's not be ashamed of it. And if we suffer a little bit, it'll be fun anyways when we go through it. Amen? Let's bow our heads for prayer just for a moment. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, worshiping with the windows open. Just as we're praying, I, I trust that you're talking to the Lord now. You say, well, what should I pray about? Well, let's pray about our worship being a little bit more public. Let's ask God to Help us live a consistent life. You say, but it's so hard. I, I, I can't talk about Jesus with my friends. If I, if I talk about Jesus at the lunch table, they will, they will send me out of the lunchroom. Well, maybe it's because we haven't lived such a consistent life. Maybe it's because they've heard that, you know, sort of distasteful language from us from time to time. And they've watched us joke in, in unholy ways and watched us be deceitful and come in late and try to 